uh, in court uh, right before a motions hearing yesterday or during a motions hearing, I should say, uh, Dick Harputlian, the lead attorney for Alec Murdoch, talked about how Alec Murdoch didn't have any motive to kill his family. He said they were perfect. Take a listen. The last point I'd make is this. His theory, and this is sort of, is, is that he knew the jig was up. So he went home and butchered, blew the head off his son and butchered his wife. There's not one shred of evidence there was any problems between any of them. There's tax, pictures, people that were with him the previous weekend at a ball game, video from that day with Paul and he having a good time. There is no dispute anywhere that they were the perfect family in terms of their relationships. No divorce, no separated, no left him, no nothing. So this is a fabrication, and they want to use what Mr. Griffin described as bad character evidence. He stole all this money, so, so he must have killed his wife and son. All right, Creighton Waters, the lead prosecutor on the case, kind of sitting there looking like he had a lot to say. Uh, Dick Harputlian, though, uh, from what I've been told, a great trial attorney. Uh, Linda Kenny Bodden, tell me uh, your thoughts on what you've seen of Dick Harputlian so far. I've told he told, been told he is a master at cross-examination. Well, I, I don't know, uh, because I haven't seen the trial, right? He's bringing all the right motions, which uh, I'm impressed with. Uh, he's got a very difficult case in terms of pretrial publicity. Uh, but so far, uh, except for the appearance, I think, that he made initially on, I think, one of the AM morning shows uh, with this case early on. Uh, he's doing all the right things, but I think the prosecutor also knows what they're doing here. I think we're going to see a, a real fight in this courtroom, and a judge is going to have to keep both of these attorneys under control. But I would say one thing to you. There is no perfect family. And if you say that to any juror, they're going to think about the TV shows that we look on YouTube back from the 50s. But, you know, um, there is no perfect family. And you're always at danger from the one you love. And keep that in the back of your mind. Uh, certainly. And when he said that, I thought to myself, <laughs> there is no perfect family. We know that uh, just from living life. We know that from watching these cases here on Law and Crime. There's no such thing as perfect. So you got to be really careful with throwing that word around. Uh, let's get back to some of our viewer questions. Uh, they were really good questions coming in and keep them coming on Twitter, YouTube, in our chat and on Facebook, and we will get to them. Uh, so I want to know, uh, this is from Christy in the Carolinas from YouTube, and I'm going to throw this one to you, Gigi. She says, or she asks, who else had the motive to kill Paul and Maggie? And at least from Paul, we know there might have been a lot of people who had something against him. Right. And that was sort of the theory in the very early days after the murder was that maybe this was a revenge killing for what happened to Mallory Beach. But I can't think of anybody. I've never heard anybody really say there was anybody else who would want the two of them dead. I mean, it just doesn't fit. Maggie seemed to be well loved in the community. And, you know, so really the only theory I ever heard was just revenge for Mallory Beach. And that uh, still, that was kind of hard to believe that somebody would go shoot the both of them. So I think it all kind of ties back. You know, we know that he was going, um, Alec Murdoch was going to have to expose his financials just days after the murder in court, which ties back to the state's theory that this was just a diversion to gain sympathy and distract from the fact that what we now know is years and years of financial crimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I'm kind of wondering, too, what would the possible motive to kill Maggie be? You know, why would somebody else have a beef with her to, to go to those lengths? So I'll be interested to see how they uh, address that, the defense, because they, they don't have to prove anything, of course, but they'll still have to, you know, address something. Uh, we have another question coming in. And Joseph, I'm going to ask you this question. Uh, it's from Anton underscore 14A from YouTube. Have they actually placed Murdoch at the scene at all? before the call to 911. I, I don't know if we know the answer to that question, but what are your thoughts? Hi, Anton. Yeah, I, I don't know that they necessarily have at this point. And, that, and certainly I think that perhaps if they do have that information, uh, SLED, who is the lead agency on this now, is gonna play that pretty close to the vest, I think. I, I would think that the defense might have some insight into that just through their discovery, but of course, 
uh, they're in their gag order now at this point in time. So that's going to be a big reveal, I think, mm -hmm. in, in court. Again, you know, going into the nature of what this is going to be like, I, I got to tell you, I don't recall in recent memory where we have covered a case like this on law and crime uh, where this is setting up for a dogfight like this. I think that it's going to be something that's going to be quite con compelling uh, mm -hmm. to watch kind of play out because there are these little instances along the way. Uh, Cousin Eddie, you know, is going to play into this. <laughs> right. Certainly the evidence I, I see our production team is putting up this image of the shirt. Um, you know, that's going to come into question. And he, here's one more thing. I think that uh, talk about putting him there. One thing that kind of sticks out to me, you know, this is not like you wind up in this location by accident. I'm talking about if you're a potential perpetrator. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're not looking for anybody. It's not like we've got a, you know, a dragnet out looking for anybody. The investigation at this point is done. I think that it's quite fascinating when you think about this place geographically, if you were to do a geographic profile on this location, how isolated it is. I mean, very isolated. Ask Gigi. She's out there right now. And she's she's in, uh, you know, kind of a uh, their urban center right now. You get out there in this location and it it implies at least just by the view of it, you have to have specific knowledge, intimate knowledge of how to move about this property because it's not something that you just, you know, randomly wind up. And then you've got these two individuals that are within, I think the, the, the yardage that we've been getting is like 30 yards separated Maggie and Paul. And then Paul is in what's referred to, it's been a storage room and feed room, I've heard thrown mm -hmm. back and forth very tight, intimate space. How are you going to know that they're there? It's perpetrated at night, all these sorts of things. So a lot of that's going to come into play in this trial. And I think what, you know, if we have drone video, we, we have some drone footage and ground video that we took and we shot of that property. And you're right, Joseph. I mean, this is an expansive property and there's this long road. When you enter the property at the gate, you go down, this long driveway and then, you know, the house is there and then the kennels are over on this other part of the property. So it's a huge, huge property. I mean, it's it's sold or it was on the market for more than $3 million. That gives you an idea of just how big it is. Um, so Gigi, what do you make of that area? I mean, have you been by the crime scene? I have not been by the crime scene, but I've seen the drone footage and it's off the road. And in fact, that's one thing that Alec Murdoch said on the 911 call, it's off the road. So it, I agree, it's not just a house you stumble upon in plain view and it's, it's huge. So you have to know where those dog kennels are and they're not right by the house. So I agree, somebody with intimate knowledge of this property knew exactly where to be to, uh, to take out Paul and Maggie. Exactly. And we just had that drone footage up for the viewers to see just how big that property is. Also, we have a diagram that was included in a uh, defense motion. I'm going to tweet that out here in a little bit so people can see where Paul and Maggie were located in that crime scene. So we're going to take a quick break. Keep your questions coming to us on Twitter, Facebook, and in our YouTube chat, and we will answer them. So stay with us. I'm Anjanette Levy, and you are watching Law and Crime.